All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, today is January 16th. I'm already cooking through the first month of January of uh, 2024. Carl will be tying up some Pat Dorsey flies and talking about meeting the man, the myth, the legend in person and give us yeah. some uh, tips that he gave to him. So I'm kind of jealous that he got to meet him. So we'll, I'm just going to race through this real quick and then let Carl take over uh fishing outing i don't know depending on this weather i don't know when we're going to be able to get out because it is cold i don't want to put anyone in danger so uh right now we'll just it's wait until things get warmer uh you know i just want for everyone's safety we don't need to push it we'll have plenty of fishing come uh spring and summer and into fall uh fly tying in person uh We'll meet up again next Monday for JB. Yesterday was closed for national holiday. Uh, Frank uh, has offered us, I think, the 4th of February from 10, well, it should be 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Uh, right. And that will be a Sunday because uh, Saturdays in February will be uh, for the rod building class. So uh, that's going to... Already, February is going to be a busy uh, month, so it will be even hard just trying to get uh, time in there to go fishing if we want. So, again, that's coming up February. Uh, we've already got the group that's coming. So uh, I sent out an email for those who are going to be helping. So if you have any questions, I could get back. Yeah, I don't want to dwell on it too much. I want to get to Carl uh zoom calls are always this time uh every tuesday the uh, meeting id and password will always remain the same uh and then again omaha they meet every week on thursday same time they use their same meeting id and passcode and they always have great classes so if you could attend make it they're very good so with that carl I'm going to put you on the spotlight and go ahead and talk to us about Pat Dorsey. Okay. Well, um, well, I guess it was about three weeks ago, I guess it was. I got to go to Ozark Mountain or Ozark Valley or Ozark Fly Fishers uh, hosted Pat Dorsey. Um, it was kind of a going to it on a drop of a whim. I, I didn't have any idea that he was actually going to be in there. I follow him on Facebook and I might follow him on YouTube. Um, but uh, I thought, well, I need to go, go do that. Um, it, uh, you know, Pat's pretty famous uh, for his, you know, a lot of his midge patterns. Um, he, he's a guide, an author and a, and a presenter. And uh, he uh, he's very down to earth, like like you would probably expect. Um, and what was what was really cool about Pat, or, you know, what, listening to him speak was all of his flies are very simple. Um, you know, he doesn't he would he said two times during his presentation that you know I, I don't type flies to make them look good. I tie flies to, to catch fish. And uh, so uh, he, I think he tied probably 10 flies in the course of maybe an hour and a half, maybe. Uh, did a presentation on all these. Uh, I'm gonna attempt to do two of them uh, for you guys tonight. Uh, one is called Pat's Midge and the other one's called Pat's Top Secret Midge. There's a lot of variations of this, um, even when he was, talking he said you know there was you know this is a variation i took off of this and this is how this got developed and did you know if you watched his youtube videos you probably would hear you know uh, get a lot more out of it than listening to me but i'll, I'll give an attempt um on uh, on trying to to demonstrate a couple of these um on the email that uh, i sent mick and he sent out you know uh I'm trying to figure out which one I should do first, but I'm going to do the harder one first. Now, I'm going to do Pat's mids, and then I'm going to do Pat's top secret midge. 
Um, the one that you're seeing on the camera here is Pat's midge, and it's kind of a mouthful to say. Um, but as he said, and uh, I'm probably paraphrasing here a little bit, that this this uh, pattern was developed um, when he and another individual, I can't remember the person's name, they were sitting there on the bank and wa just watching and observing you know, the, the fish behaving and they were standing in their water and there was these midges that were hatching right, right by their waders. And he got to thinking, you know, you know, what, you know, how can we imitate that? And so this is what he came up with. Now, this fly is a little bit of a complicated fly to some degree because it represents about two, maybe three different, could argue three different stages of a fly, um, uh, and I'm gonna try to say this correctly, but midges are a little bit like um, uh, they, you know, they have a pupa stage a lot like a caddis fly, and I think it's because I'm trying to remember the term on it, but um, you know, we got many flies, we got stone flies, we got caddis flies and midges, and the pupa stage uh, in the midge is similar to caddisflies have a pupa stage as well, uh, where mayflies don't. And so, um, you know, I that I'd, I'd heard that before, and I just never really gave it a lot of thought. I'm getting a lot of background here. Can you need somebody. So. Um, but um, so. Uh, you know, I looked at this fly after he uh, he did it, and I was like, "Wow, that's that's two or three different stages of the of the pupa." So you have a trailing shuck, you have wings, you have the thorax and the body, and then you have the antenna of the midge coming out with a with a hackle pattern on top of it, and so it looks like that transition zone of when. This represents a transition zone of when that midge is getting rid of his exoskeleton, which is the shuck, with the wings coming out, attempting to fly with his antenna coming out. Where a lot of flies, if you look at like just a, 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 the, the, the midge pupa pattern, you know, something like that, it's very, you know, very simple and Shoot, you could type two dozen of these things in an hour if you had all your materials set out in front of you. Um, and, you know, we've used a lot of these midge patterns, and they're good winter patterns. I think one of the things that that I hadn't really thought about in a while that, uh, that Pat talked about was, you know, he fishes a lot of tailwater fisheries in Colorado. And he he described a tailwater fishery as something basically 10 miles below the dam. And, you know, we don't have a lot of dams in Missouri, it's, you know, except if you go down to like any Cuomo or, or the White River below Wolf Shoals. You know, we don't have a lot of tailwater fisheries in Missouri. I don't think we have any that I know of. Um, but, uh, you know, tailwater fisheries produce a lot of large trout. They're, they produce a lot of environment. Um, for fishing, and so it's it's a great opportunity. You know, here you think about if you listen to some of these podcasts about preserving the natural streams or preserving this and preserving that. You know, you wouldn't have these fisheries, and and Pat even said this that you wouldn't have the fisheries that we have if we didn't have these tailwater fisheries. We wouldn't have the environment. You, basically, all you would have would be shad and midges in these places with warm water and that wouldn't really produce a lot of you know trout so it's kind of a i guess a little bit of a double-edged sword you know uh -huh. thinking about you know uh you know water conservation and and stream environment and those sorts of things you know the ability to uh, uh you know to have these opportunities to fish because you know a lot of our fish uh in fishing in Missouri, fisheries or you know spring-fed springs um, don't really have a lot of the you know uh, 
uh, environment that's designed on a tailwater. So a lot of our streams don't naturally produce really large fish. Um, we do have some wild fish that do survive, but generally not really big, big fish like tailwater fisheries, you know, like in the White River will produce or like Tanny Como. So, uh, you know, that that's kind of my spiel on it um, from, you know, from what Pat had said. So anyway, with that, I'll attempt to do this fly. I, I did do several of them and it, it is a little bit of a challenging fly, but but it's kind of fun. I like challenges and hopefully I'll get to fish these someday here. Um, so what I'm going to tie it on tonight is the old Mustad 94 840 a size 18 dry fly hook. And uh, uh, Mick, you said something here a while back about somebody, you know, using dry fly hooks on, you know, on nymph patterns. And that's something that Pat said a few times. Not all his patterns are on uh, on uh, dry fly hooks, but, yep. you know, he likes he likes dry flies. Uh, or, you know, uh, uh -huh. dry fly hooks for his patterns. So... Basically, what we're going to do with this pattern, we're going to need um, to tie it. I am going to be using, he used a Zelon. I'm going to be using, a, for the shuck, I'm going to be using just a polypropylene um, yarn from Hairline. Um, it's just a tan yarn. Um, uh, he used something, I think he called it Zelon. And, uh, uh, so he seems to use quite a bit of that. Um, the other thing that was interesting about Pat was, you know, he doesn't use um, hedge cement very often, if at all. Um, you know, he says, I'm fishing these flies to catch fish. I'm not, you know, I'm, it, it was almost like I'm not wasting my time with hedge cement. Um, he uses a lot of eight aught uni thread and the other thing that was interesting is he used a uh, Thompson uh, uh, whip finisher, and I learned to use, to tie on a on a Thompson, and I don't know that I even could do it today if I had to, but I'm sure I could figure it out. Um, so anyway, we're going to get started here. Um, oh, so on this fly, I'll go ahead and put it back up here. We're going to use um, we're going to use some uh, polypropylene brown yarn as the shuck. Uh, I'm going to use black thread as the body, a dot. For the wing, I'm going to just be using a, a white polypropylene wing. Um, for the thorax, we're just going to use a peacock curl, and then I'm going to use grizzly hackle to wrap it. And then for the antennae, will be part of the polypropylene. Uh, that we have left over from the uh, as we fold it over um, for the fly. Anyway, I'll shut up and get started. Here. So, any questions so far? Is it possible to have a little bit more zoom on the hook, maybe? No. Okay. Sorry, I, I got it as close as I could without knocking it off. That how's that? I can't even see if that's focused. I gotta change glasses. Yeah. That's as close as I can get it, I think, without knocking something over. No, it's not a focus. All right, that's about as good as I can get it, guys. That work? Yep. All right. Uh, so um, <laughs> one of the things that Pat said when he ties it, and I've seen it on his videos too, it, it kind of cracks me up. It's like, we're going to start a thread jam. Not a thread jam, it's thread jam. So anyway, starts it up about two-thirds behind the eye. Wrap it in. 
And so when you do on trailing shuck with this material, you don't really need a lot of it. I mean, it is very, very, very minimal. Um, I heard that a lot out of his comments on stuff. You just need a minimal amount. Everything with him is so minimal. And uh, that was that was that was refreshing to hear. So anyway, so I'm gonna I'm gonna to get my my trailing suck started. I'm gonna take it. I'm gonna start it and grab it with a loose wrap. And then kind of a trick here is like you can like that. There is way too much. So I'm gonna we only want about maybe I don't know I can't count that much but i'm gonna guess six seven fibers want very minimal amount here and one of the things that i had problems with in tying this fly when i started it was i kept pulling on my thread too tight and when i let go my my trailing shuck would splay out and it's going to spray out naturally just because of the natural materials but you want to just I hold it kind of loose, and what I found is holding it loose and tying it down, it uh, made it splay out less. So we're going to wrap just like we normally would. We're going to get up to the basically to the barb of the hook, and and basically stop right there. So what I'm going to do is, Pat said his general um, method. Uh, to the length of his tail is the length of his shank. So I'm just going to take my scissors here, measure the length of my shank, move it over to the edge of my tail, take my thumb and forefinger right here at the very end. I'm just going to snip it off there. So there's a trailing stuff. You guys see that? Yep. Yep. Okay. All right, then I'm going to wrap forward, and Pat is always very artistic about how he says this, but you want symmetrical touching wraps, symmetrical touching wraps. He's very, he says that quite a bit. All right, so the next item is to put the wing on, and, and um, as I've tied before with this poly yarn, you know, you can do the wing with with different things. Um, different ways to do it. Um, I'm going to get rid of the loose fiber, straighten it out. I'm going to go ahead and trim the edge off to square it off so I can get a, a good attachment here. And I hope I don't knock the camera over here, but I'm going to try not to. Go ahead and get a grab on it and then wrap it back tie it in now one of the things that that i've realized tying a few of these being careful is just the fact that you got to be you don't want to crowd this eye i'm tying it on an 18 and this is a small fly i did some on 14 and it was a lot easier than i had to dial it down in um but that made it it made it a little challenging but the general rule of thumb from pat was you want to try to have it at least Two thirds of the way of the shank down the hook. So we're going to make a loop wing. So I'm going to fold it over and we're going to tie this basically over on top of the of the shank. And so basically we want a, a wing basically sticking up. And you want it to look, he called it a loop wing. And you want it to look like like about that, and you, you know, that's kind of a little bit of a preference, I think. But what happens when you get done with this thing? You you, you poke it and you splay it out, and it and it looks like wings coming out. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap a few wraps up here. And again, I'm going to be very cautious about not going to get. I want to leave myself a some point on the hook here where we, we don't crowd it, other it gets to be a real booger to tie it on. All right, so being in a size 18, that is a very difficult for me to, uh, with my saddle hackle to get a narrow enough gap on here uh, to match up. So I went ahead and pulled out the thinnest ha saddle hackle I could find. 
uh, to do this. Now, I want to do Pat Dorsey some justice and and say that you know it's nice to have beautiful saddle hackles and expensive ones to get to these because obviously when you get down to these size 18 size 20 type hooks to get a hackle that size you know a lot of that comes with a little bit of a premium but it it's not past me if if I want to get a hackle to the size of it is for me to just cut the bottom end of it off to get it to land like I want to so don't don't let the the, the cost of these hackles fool you a little uh, there's ways around it in my opinion so I'm going to go ahead and tie this on I didn't hear it. Did somebody say something? Nope, my phone went off. Sorry, I thought I was a mute. Okay. So um, I've got this saddle tight on top here, and the shiny side is up. You can see that. And now I'm going to take a piece of peacock curl and um, again, uh, we've we've talked about peacock curl and 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 before. Uh, you know, you can buy these, um, you know, strung hackle. Um, you know, about every tire that I've watched or done anything with, as far as strung peacock curl, a lot of them like, oh, don't waste your money on it. Just get the peacock curl, um, and the feathers, and and you get better, better, better. Uh, you know presentation of your of your peacock but that, there there's some truth to that but this is what i got so this is what i'm using so i'm gonna tie in some peacock curl i'm gonna tie it in pretty good and if you don't if you you got to watch this because if you don't get it in tight here with your saddle hackle it it can really go bonkers on you real real quick so um uh, and and it's real easy to again crowd this fly too much. So I got it tied in. I'm gonna try to tie this. I'm used to having like eight inches behind my camera here to bring my uh my thread or my uh material around. So just bear with me here as I wrap forward. So I want to do this in a polymer fashion, touching wraps, and get about four or five turns. So I got touching wraps. I got it over. I am going over once with it to secure it. I'm going to take an additional turn to go over the top of it. And I'm going to wrap one forward. And I'm going to be pretty snug about that so I can secure that in. All right. So we have our thorax built up here. We have our abdomen, which is a thread. We have our wing and we have our trailing shuck. Now I'm going to add the wings to this thing. And we're only going to get about three wraps on this thing because you don't, you could do it, you could over wrap this thing, but the way I took it, three wraps will about get your, get the, get the job done. So I got three wraps, lift it up, one over the top of it. I like doing a second one to secure it. And I like doing another one behind it. And then I'm going to trim off my hackle. Kind of moved on me there a second there. Ah. And if you crowd the eye like I just did there, it, it'll, it'll get away on you. So I'm going to take one wrap off of this thing. Because if you don't, if you don't leave yourself some room there, you will not get it on. So, because there's a lot of material on this little bitty hook here. All right, so now we have our antenna sticking up here, and that's a little long. But basically, I'm going to take my thumb and forefinger, I'm going to go over the top here, and I am going to do some tight wraps right up here, up on front here. And you want to make sure you keep your eye clean here. So I'm going to take my whip finisher. Get 
try to get about three wraps here. And if you crowd the eye like I did here, and that was even taking one off. This is what I call a total nerdy geek fly here because this is this thing's got a lot going on here. So now all we need to do is trim this for the antennae. And then you can take your your finger and just kind of poke these, poke your wing back a little bit. And there you go. Very nice. Like I said, it's a lot yeah, like that. A little bitty hook. What size hook was that again? This was an 18. This is a Mustad 94 840. And I'm probably one of the, I bet John Wright knows what that one is. This is a dry fly hook that Mustad had for ages. So it looks good. That is a lot of material on an 18, though. And that's why I was saying, like, it's really, really difficult to get, you know, a good saddle hackle to be up on that part. But, um, you know, it it's a challenging fly. And I thought, well, that would be fun to kind of to show just because just for just for the pure, pure simple challenge of it. Yeah. Um, you know, put, you know, push the limits a little bit with yourself to try to get try to get something you know going on there um so um the the next one i'm going to do here um make sure i say it right this is pat's top secret midge um, one of the things that pat said about the pat's midge is that he said he goes all these years i've had the you know i says i don't know how i would would survive without this other fly we just did well he said the same thing about this one here too Pat's top secret midge. So um, I don't know if it's really a top secret, but anyway, I'm going to use um, for this one. Um, he used a brown thread. I'm going to be using a wine colored um, eight aught. Eight aught seems to be a, a very common uh, thing that he likes. He's a big uni thread fan, um, but I'm going to be using a wine color, but you could use a brown and Basically, what if you watch his video on it, he's like, you can use, you know, your, you know, sky's the limit on what colors you want to use with this. Uh, the key thing about this fly that I thought was interesting was even though it's thread body, the ribbing on it to represents the segmentation on the fly. Just a simple white thread. And he said, you know, a lot of people have problems getting the segmentation right with the white thread. And he said one of the things that he would recommend is make sure you use a piece of a piece of clean thread each time you do it. Because, you know, if you're using thread over and over, your hands touch it and it frays and, and, and that sort of stuff. So all I'm going to be using is just a, you know, an eight aught white thread. This happens to be some Hemingway thread that I got um, uh, a while back. And it, it's a fairly good thread. I don't tie a lot with it with other things. I'm just kind of one of those Amazon buys that, yeah, that looks good. And then you get it and you're like, yeah, I don't know if that was so good. But anyway, figure out a way to use it up here in the next couple lifetimes I have going on. So um, anyway, this is a very simple fly. Um, you can tie this in black. It looks a lot like the black midges. Um, uh, a little bit of a story from a long, long time ago, 20 plus years ago, maybe even longer than that. Um, when I was living in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, I was a member of the, uh, we had a, a TU club that we started in uh, Cape Girardeau. And uh, some of us went down to the uh, Oz uh, Arkansas uh, Salbug conclave that they have every year i think it's in march this year if i remember right um and uh so anyway one of the guides that i became a little bit acquainted with and i actually fished with one of his guides here on a on a trip it was a christmas gift uh on the white river um 
I went down and fished with him for a day. And then uh, I went out myself the next day to see if I could do as good, if I could pick up anything. One of the flies we used was very similar to this, only it was black. And um, it was actually tied on a dry fly hook. And, but it was black with some ribbing and a little bit of dubbing and that was it. So this pattern is a very productive pattern, you know, for any type of, uh, you know, I wouldn't just say specifically tailwater fisheries because I have caught trout at Bennett Springs um, in the winter time uh, using this type of a pattern. Um, and, you know, when you talk about rig setup, one of the things that Pat talked a little bit about was his rig setup. And uh, so one of my things that I kind of became accustomed to here in the last couple of years, especially, especially in the winter time, uh, but anytime I'm nymphing, um, I've gone to a non-slip uh, loop when I put my, my double riggings together, um, especially when I'm, when I've got a nymph on, if I'm fishing two nymphs and I'm, what I thought was interesting that Pat, when he sets his rig up, he's got his, you know, he's got his leader material. Um, then he uh, he ties on with a clinch knot his his nymph, and he usually has the heavier one in the center. He does a clinch knot to the hook on the back of his middle fly and his point fly. He does a clinch knot as well, you know, depending on the water depth and stuff, anywhere from 12 to 18 inches from the midpoint fly. But what I got out of it was the midpoint fly is actually a heavier fly. Typically, I'll use the point fly as a heavier fly. I have, is my idea or thought is because, you know, I want that fly to get down there and I want to get that midpoint fly to kind of act as natural as it can. What I thought was interesting is, is that his justification, if I get it right, was that having that heavier fly in the middle versus that it pulls it down and it pulls it down past the point fly and that point fly actually comes up and it, and it makes it look a little more natural. But he uses it with a clinch knot and not a, um, not a uh, non-slip loop knot. And so I thought that was interesting. I've had a few conversations with different people in my past on that i guess the jury's out whatever works for your works but i've got a lot more fish with a non-slip loop knot on a nymph than i have with a clinch knot that's just me maybe it goes into that confidence level thing that people talk about a lot it's like i know i can catch fish this works for me and, I, and it works so you know it goes back to whatever works for you uh kind of thing all right so any questions? None yet. All right. Well, um, on this particular fly, I'm going to use the size 6 Honic uh, check nymph. Uh, it's barbless. Um, and um, it's a little bit different than the, this particular one that I tied here because I ran out of my other ones. So that's all I have left on my check nymphs. Or, uh, some sort of a curved nymph hook, if you will. So this is a very fast tie. Um, takes longer to talk about it than it takes to do it. So, um, all right. so I'm going to tie that in. Again, this is barbless. I'm using, again, I'm using a wine colored uh, dot thread and, um, you know, I don't know if you wanted to look for like a Chardonnay or Pinot Noir, but anyway, this one looks pretty good here. I'm gonna go ahead and get it started. Do a little bit of a thread start here. And I'm gonna take some fresh white thread per Pat Dorsey's recommendation. And this will be my ribbing. It's not wire, it's thread. And I thought that was really interesting. So go ahead and just get a get it started. And 
We're going to do symmetrical touching wraps. That's my new term. I love it. Symmetrical touching wraps. And we are going to wind this down into the bend of the hook. I'm going to stop right about there. And I'm going to do touching wraps back up. Try to do touching wraps. And some people might say, since you're, you know, this is kind of the nymph to the pupus, pupus type stage pattern. I'm going to wrap that up in here. Wrap back. And I don't know that you really need a lot of taper on this. I guess to me, it's kind of personal preference. I'm going to build a little, a very small, little bitty taper there. I'm going to take my white thread and I'm going to just wrap forward here. And this is what I'm going to be using to create the segmentation. Go forward, wrap over the top of it to secure it in. My old little rule of thumb is I go one back and then I go one or two up front. So I don't know if you guys can see that, but that's your segmentation on this fly. So then I am going to get our wing in. Now he had um, mentioned in his uh, presentation that, oh, where did that go? Lost my yarn I had set out. I guess I'll have to get some more out. Um, he had mentioned uh, uh, some sort of embroidery thread that had some kind of a flash in it. And I'm like, and I didn't get the name down on it. So it's just... DMC. It's DMC. Okay. Yeah, you can get it over at uh, Hobby Lobby and uh, places um, like that. It's in the uh, fabric embroidery uh, okay. area. I've used a lot of it. Um, you can unbind it to really, really tiny, small little fragments of like 0 .0001 uh, of an inch. So you can, and it's got tinsel wrapped around a mylar core. Cool. Well, it's pretty cool stuff. I had never heard of it, so that was a new one on me. Thank you for that. So we're just going to tie a little bit of a wing in here. I'm going to get a couple secure wraps on it. And I think one of the things that I picked up the most out of that was after you get it secured on those flies, he really pulls on it to get it to stand up. Pull it back and get it secure. And I'm going to use some, uh, just some regular dubbing here. I'm going to use a, a very thin dubbing, um, just any kind of a fine, fine dubbing. And one of the things that was really cool about Pat that I did, I noticed too, when he was tying, like he didn't worry so much like on this fine dubbing, but like when he was doing some dubbing, boy, he spent a lot of time lining that stuff up. I mean, I do that too, but out of habit. But then I'm like, you know, that look, it was really pretty cool to watch him do that because I've seen so many good tires do that. I don't know if it made, made me feel like I actually knew what I was doing or made me feel good about it or what. <laughs> All right. So we only need really very minimal amount here. So I, basically about an inch, inch and a half. I probably got too much on Get a little bit of dubbing and excuse the camera here for a second, really close. Get a little bit more on.
So Pat described this as getting somewhat of a football shape set up in there where you create this thorax up here. And uh, I'm going to put a little bit more on there. I didn't you know, like that. I need a little bit more. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap up a little bit of a head on this thing. Just to kind of secure it all in. Like I said, it takes longer to talk about this fly than it does to really actually do it. But and the last part is trim our wings off. So hold it up. And the best way I would describe it is cut it out about a 45 degree angle off the, the back end of your fly. And then tease it with your finger. And that creates your wings and there you go. would be interesting to see what uv would do on the back part of the body you know with the thread yeah you know i've um one of john Urock's things that he's talked about in some of his old fly pattern books like one of his old favorite fly patterns was the uh hair's ear parachute and for the ribbing on it he always used some sort of a dark thread you know he twist. He, he mentioned in a couple of his books about twisting it and and, I, and I've done that with 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 a parachute or with a hair's ear parachute it gives it that buggy look so I've used thread before on it I you know I guess I've always been like so focused and concentrated on getting a uh, you know some sort of a wire because I think I need to get it to sink sooner you know maybe some more durability um, but you know, again, way I'm thinking conceptually about, you know, his rig setup having that heavier fly in the center part. And if this was a lighter fly, if this was your point fly, it actually would be floating up in the current, which might actually make sense that it looks a little bit more realistic. So he's using three flies, right? Two. Oh, two. Okay. And then he'll also like on him for... His rig setup is he'll put a piece of uh, a non toxic split shot above his tippet, and then he uses tungsten putty if he needs more weight to get it down sooner. I've never heard of tungsten putty. That's interesting. Yeah, I started, I, I came across using thread as a rib tying in Ray Bergman wet flies. There's a lot of, most of the ribs in there are, are another thread material yeah um and then yeah it's kind of weird how how old stuff comes back around and everybody's like oh that's a great idea nice thing <laughs> yeah. about using Carl, the thread. Carl, how, how durable are these flies nice thing about using thread is that you can if you use white you can color it anything you want yeah. so that's you know amy's talking Absolutely. about that a lot Carl, yeah how, how durable are these flies Oh, you can catch a thousand fish on this wall. You don't even need dynamite. Oh, seriously? Hmm. Do they want to die? Well, you no, can I... catch a dozen or two easy. Yeah. Because it is one of my favorite flies in the spotlight. There's the one I tie. And it looks there, but if I put my thumb in it, it's a size yeah. 22. And I'll catch a couple dozen on it. What kind of it, bead is that? It's actually a glass bead. Uh, That's what it looks like. It's what? this killer canis, and you can see the beads in there. I don't put any weight on it, kind of like Carl was saying. I'll put this, you know, as a, like almost a, what would be a, a nip, you know, that uh, white uh, thread jig I like. Sometimes I'll throw this behind it. it it has no weight and it just kind of flutters there. So I put some kind of a tractor fly down. It gets your attention, but 
that size 22 uh, Mayfly did a cool little demo out there where they grabbed a bunch of rocks from Bennett, put it in a glass container, put, you know, water from the spring there. And you could actually see the scuds. And it was about that size of a 22. And, you know, I just like, yeah, there's mm. no weight to them. So they'd be flooded around. So I actually went to this glass bead and it so, worked. <laughs> so on that subject of glass beads, that actually came up. I'm glad you brought that up. I'm just going to pass on what Pat said. Because cool. people say, well, glass beads. And he says, well, they're not glass. They're plastic. Yes. And and a lot of his midge patterns um, had that. I didn't I didn't touch that. I, I you know, I saw those and I'm like, well, I'll, I'll, I'll just try to do something, you know, a couple things that I like. But thanks for bringing that up, Nick, because that's that that's something that, as far as when you're talking about pat George patterns or water fishery patterns or winter fishing patterns. That was one that he did a lot of. A lot of his had a glass bead on it. So, yeah. Glass so, beads. What they're made of is a lot. Is a lot of function of where you buy them. If you buy a glass bead from a fly shop, yeah, you'll probably get plastic. But if you buy it from a jewelry distributor, and you go to what's called the Sborsky Crystal, you get real glass beads. I I bought a bunch of them, and I'm here to tell you, uh, they're a lot cheaper than going to the fly shop, and they are a much better bead. Well, I uh, I tie a lot of midge. I like fishing small stuff. I just, you can see on camera maybe. Uh, I just picked these up at Hobby Lobby. And I got a white, a yellow, or a white, red, and black ones. And they're little seed beads. And I put my glasses on, I can tell you what size they are. But uh, I use them all the time on on little midge patterns. Is that Savorsky Trent? No, these are, these are seed beads from, uh, Hobby Lobby, and they're 11 on. Yeah, yeah, I get a lot of them, and I think those are actually glass. I don't think that they're... Uh, yeah, they may be glass. Yeah. And then... My wife's the jeweler, and she uses a lot of them, and she says they're glass, so... Yeah, my... Uh, well, my wife does a lot of counter cross stitch, and she buys them, and she gets 10,000 in those things, and then she she needs, like, 100. And then I get free fly tying stuff, so it all works. <laughs> yeah. I get the well, same would... thing with my wife's jewelry. I get all her extra Savorsky crystal. Oh. Yeah. Hey, so John, if you got a source for those, just write it down. And when we meet, I'll see if I can find some. I mean, the, that crystal would really add a lot of pop to the fly. You know what I mean? In the water for refraction. Trust me, Bill. I've got enough crystal bees to last the whole group a lifetime. Oh, okay. Um, John. Well, I'm just going to just buy some, you know, or get some or buy some or whatever, you know. Oh. Whatever, you know, whatever's fair. I like that. Yeah, that well, one I want to try. I wanna... Thanks, Carl. Yeah, that one I want to try putting a little bit of uh, UV on the back end and might even do uh, a UV shuck on it or even take pheasant's uh, tail and do a do a shuck over the top of it. That could be interesting. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just, just hey. looking at that, what it would kind of look like. Hey Carl, you you mentioned that you used to live in Jackson years ago, or in Cape Girardeau. Yes. Were you were you down here when uh, JBR was still in operation? Mm. It was an Orvis dealer down here in in Cape. Yeah, they went out right about the time we got in. Yeah, that was back. Oh, okay, nineteen ninety seven, I think. Yeah, because I, I left in 93 for the Army. But uh, did you ever meet uh, Walker Irving? He worked in there? He was a, I, he was a TU I, member I and a have, Federation member. I might have, yeah. yeah. I mean, I would go in there. And when I, back in that time, the I mean, there just wasn't a lot in there. No, they there wasn't. Were kinda, they were almost like closing out almost because they were like, hey, we yeah. got a fly shop in Cape Girardeau. I'm like, okay, cool. And we get down there. I'm like, this really isn't a fly shop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Walker was the older guy with the beard that worked there. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't remember him if I met him. I, I yeah. might. Because I, I learned to cast in the parking lot of JBR is where I learned to cast fly rod. Oh, my. Okay. 
Yeah, they didn't. They, they, you know, fly fishing was in Cape Girardeau was kind of something that was just like hit and miss. And I don't know, it never really, I don't even know if the TU program is even going on. I was one of the founding members of that group. Um, no, it's gone and there's nothing down here now. Yeah, it was kind of, it kind of went, I think it kind of went away because I was a president. I was a secretary for one year and then I was a president the next year. And then the guy that was the president took over the next year after I was there and I was secretary again. And then I ended up getting president again. And then I left because I moved away. And then I don't know what happened to it after that. Yeah. So. All Very right. good. Thank you, Carl. I appreciate it. I don't know if you let me see we got like five minutes. I don't know if he had any more tips. I know I put some of them or I saw some of them that you had. Okay. Well, one of the things uh one of the things I would I would I would mention too that now that I'm thinking about it, um Mick, oh quite a while back you had showed talking about putting uh some sort of a um, uh, Pat talked about his strike indicator, you know, and he goes, don't be embarrassed about using a strike indicator. He goes, I don't use bobbers. I make a strike indicator. And he is what he called Holly cord, H O L L Y. And he used, um, five sixteenths inch ortho rubber bands. He put them over a forcep, wrapped it four or five or six times, and then open the forcep up. And then um, you pull it over your, your leader, pull it through, and then you take your polycord and you six millimeters of it, you know, three or four inches long, two or three yeah. inches long, whatever you want, and uh, or the holly cord. I keep calling it holly, but it's holly cord. And I, I haven't even attempted to go try to find any of this stuff. He, he likes brown, and he put it in there, and he likes it because he can move it up and down the leader to adjust however he wants but when he puts it through there he had a piece of a uh, dowel that he had he wears a lanyard and uh, nothing against people with lanyards they're they're cool i guess um but he had a piece of velcro around a uh like a little dowel that he had on his lanyard and when he put the poly the holly cord through it he uh put uh, he fluffed it up with the Velcro, his little dowel thing, and just fluffed it up like that. And then what he did from there was he put some of that uh, silicone uh, dry floating on there and, and worked it in there and fluffed it up like a big apro, I guess you could say. And, you know, like a big hairdo, just a fluffy hair kind of thing. And and he put it on there and, it, um, and he says it'll it'll float all day. Now, um, somebody asked him about the the New Zealand strike indicator, and he said he didn't really like the New Zealand strike indicators. In fact, he said he and another guy had developed that like a year before that New Zealand strike indicator even came out. Um, but uh, it has the same concept, so I'm I am definitely going to be uh, moving towards that. I've got a New Zealand strike indicator kit that I got maybe like five years ago, and Honestly, I've been, I have not been real happy with it as far as a strike indicator. It, I've gotten it to work. It takes a little bit more work, but I really like the idea of the rubber bands, the ortho rubber bands. Yeah. Put in it, uh, something I'm definitely going to be going to be trying here in the future. So he, I've used, the, I've used I, the Dorsey strike indicator for quite a while, um, and the nice thing about them is you, you get some bonnie cord, is what it's called, which is n nothing more than macrame cord. And you make them out of that, then it takes, uh, oh, God, you can make a 1,000 of them an hour. Hey, Carl, could you bring one of those in Monday? One of the flies or the what? The Strike indicator. I think you were talking. I, yeah, I don't. Uh, yeah, I can bring the New Zealand one. I don't have any uh, Bonnie cord or Holly cord mm -hmm. to make one with. but I um, can. I, I have a ton of Bonnie cord. I actually might have... Uh, a Dorsey indicator, possibly uh, ready. Mick, you got some of those Dorsey indicators, haven't you? I I could make up a bunch, but yeah, I don't see a Dorsey indicator. But if you could look, I've got the 
or it's like it a sonic uh, rubber band. Yeah, you got the rubber bands. <laughs> and I've I got... use it. The main thing you have to use with the Bonnie cord is I'm trying to think of you do have to treat it. I'm trying to think of the permanent stuff. It'll I I looked for it last week. I can't find it, but there's a permanent a watershed. Watershed. Thank you. Whoever said that, thank you. Watershed. You have to put it on 24 hours beforehand, let it dry. But if you use the Bonnie cord as a Dorsey indicator with right. watershed, it will float for a long time. And once in a while, you might have to do a couple uh, casts to air it out. Usually, I just roll cast. But if I start seeing that trying to sink, you just do a you know a regular back cast, and it'll air it out, and you'll be good for another half hour easy. But I can. Well, I, found, I found some new stuff to use instead of the Bonnie cord. Uh, is this stuff right here? Let me. No, I'm gonna. Fentex. Is that the pen? Yeah, Fentex. Yeah, Fentex. Yeah. All right, I'm bringing. And I use that instead of the Bonnie cord. It 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 floats like a cork. Yep. Slipper and craft yarn. Where did uh, you get that? Is that a, like at Hobby Lobby? Actually, I got it from Canada. And if you need any, let me know. I've got about six thousand yards of it in about seventeen <laughs> different colors. So just let me know what colors you want, and I'll let you know if I got them and ship them to you. And, and, and it's, it's great brown. for wing. And and Al uses it a lot. That's where we found out about it yeah. was Fentex. It's like the replacement for the poly yarn, right, John? Yeah. Yeah, we learned about it from Al Beatty, and I talked to Al about it, and he says, "Yeah, that's all he uses for his Dorsey indicators anymore." I could find it on uh, Amazon. It looks yeah, like... but the colors are limited on Amazon. If you want some yellows or uh, bright colors like that, you'll have to go to Canada to get them, and the shipping charges are outrageous from Canada. Yeah. For the Fentex that I'm seeing online, they've got white. They've got uh, hot pink. Uh, I'd say those yeah, are but... probably two choices for colors or indicator i see white and hot pink and if you do uh there's your hot pink yeah what, how do you spell that hot pink h-o-t no. fentex there you go yeah you've got to get it from hot old mill in canada hey, amazon John. carries it they just oh. don't have the 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 uh the choices yeah there you go that's it mick right there that's on amazon right amazon yeah mm -hmm. i could get it for a three pack for six bucks free uh yeah. free shipping yeah i wanted yellow and i couldn't find it i had to go to canada and i wanted red for my bonnie court for a uh, bonnie replacement and i had to go to canada um but like i say i've got just about every color they make so if yeah. anybody I'm needs any and it comes in <laughs> These big, you know, these skeins like this. And there's, uh, I forget how much there is in here, but. Looks 162 like yards, isn't it? Yeah, it's what? 164 yards. 164 yeah. yards, pack. yeah. And you use about a yard for a fly or for, uh, for your life. So, you know, I mean, yeah. that, that's. They, yeah, I don't. One Excuse of the me. things that Pat Dorsey said, you know, when he talked about colors, somebody asked him about colors, about strike indicators. and. He said he's partial to tan, um, but he said you could use white and and yellow, just basically what you want. But he really likes that indicator, and 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 I would agree with him on the concept of it because like using the Australian one kit that I bought a, a few years back, you know, it it I would agree with him. It doesn't do as well. I mean, I I've had struggles with it. I've had to put, you know, floating on it to get it to work. I've had to work at it to get it to work. But my biggest problem with the New Zealand one was the little tubes. The time I zipped that tube up on it, I've blown them out. And what I really liked about the rubber band idea was like, crap, that is so simple. And yet, yeah. and then the way he moved it up and down and it stayed where he wanted it. And I'm like, crap, all these years I've been using Pulsa, I've been using this, I've been using this. And what a, it's a freaking great idea. Oh. Carl, yeah. is, that, is that rubber bands? Is that like the the dental dental uh, bands? Yes. Yeah, yeah the 5 inch inch uh, ortho rubber bands is what he was talking about. Well, if I bring in a bunch of four sips, 
Monday, you bring in some of the other stuff. Yeah, if you guys, if Mick could bring some of that yarn or that. Yeah, I could bring it in. We, we, we could get about a thousand of those rubber bands that it pops, so. Yeah, we, I, I'll show you how to do it. It's really simple, really, really simple. So I'm, I'm definitely going to be transitioning to that for my strike indicator, definitely for the future. So, go, so what you do is you spotlight yourself, oh. Mick. Yep. Yeah. Hold on. I'm trying to, so I don't drop this. So you basically make a loop, stick your uh, leader through the loop, right? And then tighten the strike indicator against it and flatten it out, and the rubber band holds it in place. Is that how it works? Oh, no, I haven't no. seen it ever. No, there's a zoom, there's a video on how to use the Dorsey indicator. So yeah, uh, it's it's a little bit more complex than that, but yeah, it's very simple. So you might want to check that out, Bill. Definitely. I'll write that down. Yeah, it's neat indicator. I would say uh, I'm pretty much sold on the Oros now because they had the small, but now they came out with the extra small, and there's a differences. So that's the extra yeah. small on top, which. Uh, the small on the bottom, when I would try to use uh, like a nymph underneath it, the hits, it's too buoyant. And so it kind of, I was missing hits. But once they came up with this extra small, it's too easy. And it never sinks and it's easy to cast. I don't have yeah, to I mess just... with it. They cost about three and a half bucks, which is what the Brigger Oros do. Uh and it just makes it a little bit too easy. I still keep the smalls because I do like fishing with, uh, you know, these egg patterns right here. So these get really heavy and those will pull down the extra smalls. So I keep the smalls and extra smalls. And this is what I do. And I just keep them in. They actually come in a tin now and I just keep it all under in a tin and you know it's that small i just keep it in my pack and that's my indicators now yeah i got mine here a couple of weeks ago i'm going to try them down there with a tenkara rod and see what i i've never tried to strike indicator on a tenkara rod it should prove is, interesting. is that legal yes no absolutely not for Don't me it does buddy i'm doing it and <laughs> it works it works uh i, I think i read where the leader police will take your rod away from you if you yeah, do that sure yeah, well, I'll tell you what, Tenkara USA will definitely take my rod away if they catch me with a with a strike indicator. <laughs> yep. But I've used the uh, Oros with uh, my Tenkara, and it works fine. Does it? Okay. Yeah. It's actually fun. You know, I know a lot of people give Tenkara rods a hard time. I have mine. I have a blast with it. It's... They got their place, you know. I mean, I love them on small streams. Uh they're kind of hard to use down at uh, Bennett because that water is too big for them. But, uh, you know, you can, you can still use them. I caught a lot of fish down at Bennett on mine. So I do I, this one location. I know there's several of everyone out here has fished where I like to fish. I know yeah. the first time I used the 10 care Frank was sitting right next to me and you know, it's my same hot spot and he probably got a good laugh because once you hook into it, you're like, Oh wait, I don't have a way to kind of strip this in. So that's <laughs> when you have to figure <laughs> that out. So I was the entertainment trying to figure that out for the first yeah. time. But you know, they're fun little rods, you know, and yeah. they, they cast beautifully. You know, you just a little twitch and it's out there, and you don't have to worry about stripping line and you know it floating down into the your buddy next to you. They definitely have a blah fun. blah blah. blah. <laughs> hey man, yes. Um, question. Have you tried yes. it, Carl? Have you tried it? Have I tried one? Yes. No, I'm afraid I would get struck by lightning. Oh, okay, there you go. See, so you're <laughs> bad luck to something you've never tried. Typical I, American fly it looks fisher. too simple. It has to be more complicated than that. <laughs> yes. No. Yeah. Um, Wait till you get hey, to what? be my age. You're going to learn the simple is better and the better. The more simplistic you can make it, the better you are. Yeah. And the lighter weight you go, the better you are, right, John? Absolutely, especially when you got a bad back and a bad neck. You can't even wear a, you know, I used to wear one of those things around your neck. What do they call them? A lanyard? A lanyard, yeah. I used yeah. to wear that until it got to the point where I couldn't wear it anymore because the little bit of pressure it put on my neck made me sick, actually. It made me physically wow. sick. So. Oh, geez. John, John, a match, yeah. a waterproof match, and dynamite. It's very light. <laughs> there you go. 
It's yeah. light, it's simple, and it's quick. I like it. <laughs> and Annette, and Annette. And Annette. And Annette, yes. Hey. I actually did fish that way one time down in Albany, Georgia, in a river down there. And I'll tell you what, we got enough fish for a fish fry for the whole squadron. Oh, Jesus. That's <laughs> funny. Um, we got caught. We got caught using a landline, one of those electrical phones. That you yeah, 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 yeah. We threw that out. And one of the guys got caught doing it. The freaking North Carolina game warden confiscated the army, the army landline, and put the guy to jail. You know. Yeah. Oh yeah. That'll get you there. Yeah. Oh yeah, I remember those. No, Thirty-one so kilo. Sure a lot of voltage. Yeah. yeah. Thirty. Worked, that was a third. Worked really good on catfish. Yeah. Yep. Uh, <laughs> Question on the mop, Nick. On the Where, The mop stuff. I I'm I may have an opportunity to go fishing in Texas to okay. go after sea trout and maybe uh, redfish. Right. So a friend yes. of mine wants me to go down and teach him how to do some stuff. Where did what kind what you can buy mop material, but I've seen people that make you know that looks like nice fuzzy eggs, right? Yeah. Uh, and stuff like that. And so I've been trying to figure out where's the best place to find that material that doesn't cost you three arms, four legs, and two teeth? Uh, I still, my favorite is Amazon. I swear I always go there. The material that I really like now is called Ecstasy. Uh, I do have, it's funny, I got some of the McFly foam sitting right there where you should put it in a pen. And this worked really good until I went to uh, Eggs. Called Eggs? E G E S T, E G G S T A C Y. So you got to put the egg in there, and Fentex will work just fine. Yeah. Oh, Fentex. Yeah. How do I? Do I just make it into a knot then, or? Um, I will show you Thursday night. Remind okay. me, and I'll I'll show you how I do mine. Okay, thanks. Because I, I want to. Because those will work really effective in Storm Lake for like making um the flies that look like. The floating cottonwood for the carp. Yes. Yeah. Those are those are dynamite for those guys. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Mick's got one right there. That's. Yeah. This is this one has done very well for me. If you go to uh, on Facebook, the Project Healing Waters for St. Louis, you'll actually see this fly in a very nice trout I caught during the construction uh, during the winter, man, this has been really good. My favorite white thread jig was not working. I put this on and it was probably every other cast and it's yeah. super simple to tie. And if you guys Ball want fly. someday, I could, maybe we could do that next week, uh, Tuesday. I'll do, we'll just call it out now. I'll do different egg patterns with different materials. Oh, yeah. Thank you. So. Yeah, Mick, are you using a, 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 a ballpoint pen for your, your feeder? Uh, yeah, I for the uh, McFly the phone, yeah. yeah, that's what I use too. Yep, and I just kind of feed it through. And uh, the nice yep. stuff I use is a clown, but I have pink and all that. And this is really nice until I would really say I, the ecstasy made it real easy. And I just put a red uh, bead on it. Yeah. So it looks like a hot spot, like red blood. And I like the color. Color is really nice. It looks like a salmon yeah. egg. Yeah, it's a salmon. Mm -hmm. It looks like a salmon egg, and uh, like I said, I was at Bennett in November. Couldn't catch anything on my go-to fly that I love, and went to this, and it was every other cast. And if like if you go on to the St. Louis, I put it in there. That fish was close to four pounds, and I wow. was not expecting it. I asked uh, Ben if he put it out there, and he goes, he actually thinks it was near that inlet forever and then when they knocked it out was where i was fishing it lost its little hiding spot and then went out into the spring and you know it was catch and release so he was back out there but uh nice fish you know, so you stuff the stuff through the pan in upstate new york on the, mo on the yes uh, the salmon that's river. the mcfly the mcfly uh material you go through the pen the ecstasy almost looks like a a, ch a chenille that you put maybe three wraps on and so you could probably do a hundred flies with the amount that you buy because you, yeah, you that comes go one two three years done say again and the ecstasy's got a lot better colors yes i like it it's 
I, I feel a lot easier to tie and you get a better looking egg. It actually kind of wispy, so it kind of moves a little bit in the water. You can kind of see it's got a little bit of movement to it. And... No, because yeah. I saw an egg sucking leech pattern that they use in um, Argentina, right? You know, it's a little bit of uh, black rabbit zonker and then, yeah. you know, the red uh, or the orange uh, egg in front of it. And so I, I'm just trying to read and understand what I'm going after and, you know, what can be used. Um, and, you know, I like can storm lake. We've got leeches and the fish feed on those. Right. Yeah. So it might be a different colored egg, you know, might be a walleye colored egg, which might be a lighter colored egg. But you yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. Bill, are you talking about fishing for redfish in Florida or fishing for something in storm lake? No. First thing is, is I'm fishing for sea trout in down around Galveston right? Sea trout and redfish down there. And yeah. so what I would recommend you do is like I said in my email, there's several uh, YouTube videos from the, mm -hmm. the folks in Norway. Right. And they show you the flies that they use for sea trout. And there's right. also several for Florida, which are the same fish as you're going to fish for in Texas. Yep. Mm -hmm. Speckled trout. Five flies that work really, really well on sea trout. Yeah. Yeah. I, there's like 10 and I just kind of looked at those. <laughs> and so I got some good ideas there. And then I just happened to see something they were doing in Argentina that kind of popped up as kind of another little YouTube thing underneath it. Well, the egg sucking leech is a very common pattern for anybody yeah. that fishes for salmon. So yeah, that's actually a, uh, an Atlantic salmon pattern that's been around for years. So. Okay. Just remember that those, uh, those sea trout, speckled trout, Mm -hmm. teeth. They have they have fangs. Yes, yeah, they it's do. Fangs. <laughs> yes, fangs they is do. a better word. I think Terry got yeah, it right. That sure is. That's the operative word. Yeah, and they, they do have bite. fangs. <laughs> Don't try to lip anything in salt water. So no, no. I, I've been using. I've been making little crabs. I, yeah. I know, Mick, you've seen them, right? The ones I made, and they. they I'll spotlight you if you have it on you. Those crabs I got rid of a long time ago. Okay. Oh, those? Yeah, very, we don't want to see those. Very good pattern down there. Um, yeah, sea trout are not are not trout, actually, no. and they don't take the same flies that trout do. So they're they're a shrimp fish. They they like shrimp, as I recall. Yeah. So they the pink color works really them. well with them. Yeah. Yeah, they're they look like a speckled trout. In fact, a lot of people in Florida refer to them as speckled trout. But, yeah, uh, that's what you'll hear them called fish, speckled trout until you look at their heads and you see those fangs. <laughs> yeah, that's usually around the flats. So what you were talking about, you look, you're hunting for the speckled trout, the uh, red fish, some mm -hmm. of the bone fish, and if you could find, man, a delicious eating fish. Uh, if you could try to tie up shrimp patterns, just any of that pink like that uh, ecstasy fly and throw them around pylons. If you could get the sheep said, oh, those things fight unreal. And then if you want to have a meal later, there's nothing better than sheep's head. Bill, just get a hold of the uh, Galveston Healing Waters program down there. And uh, if you're going oh. down that part of Texas and ask them for some guidance on what they're using. Oh, I can do that. I never thought of that. Uh, you got to start remembering that we got programs all over the country, and if you want to, if you're going to go someplace you've never been before, get a hold of those of our, of our friends down there. Yeah. yeah, I mean that's a great idea. I would, I would have just sojourned on my own and researched on the YouTube and internet and flow from flown from there. No, you'll be you'll be overwhelmed with their generosity. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I'm I'd love to learn. Plus, you know, my roommate from Wentworth uh wants me to teach him a little bit how to fly fish right so um he gave me a really nice christmas gift so i got some money to buy some fly tying materials and he says well come on down um i want i want you to teach me how to fly fish my sister gave me a fly rod 10 years ago um and i said well yeah i can come down and teach you and so he said you know we'll come down sometime in march before it gets too late he said there'll obviously be a lot of pressure on the fish but if we throw them stuff that they don't see uh we might have a good chance yep. yeah i never thought of seeing if there's a pwhh you know in the area there, no, there is guarantee you yeah i'll see i find them on facebook and pm them or something 
go out to the website, projecthealingwaters.org, uh, and uh, look up under location. You'll find it. Okay. All right. I'm going to let you guys go. It's 40 minutes past. Uh, if you want, you guys could stick around. I'll still be here if you want to chat a little bit more, but I don't want to make people feel obligated that they got to stick around. So, uh, All right. Have a good week. We'll see you guys next week. Yep. Good everybody. Thanks. I'll for be in the patterns next Harry, week. Have a good one. Thanks, yeah, I hope Carl. we don't get four inches on Thursday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's the only thing I heard, John. We might, they're talking one to four and it's supposed yeah. to hit just as we had to our class. I'll tell you what, if, uh, well, I got two classes. If, if we'll watch and see what OPS does, if OPS closes, we'll cancel. Okay. So I'll see you tomorrow, right? At victory. Uh, no. Victory's Thursday too. Oh, is Victory Thursday? I keep on thinking Victory's Wednesday. Okay, well, if it's Thursday, that works. Okay, brain's just the wrong day. Teaching a, teaching a rod building. <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, I do have a replacement fighting butt just in case I don't like mine. It's a slightly different style, but, you know, it, it was just so loose in it because I had to use so much tape to uh, put it down. You know what I mean? Make your own. Make your own. Yeah. So that's okay. what I got. So okay. um, I know I'll see you tomorrow. Yeah, I'll see you in Lincoln. Yep, yep. I've already got my Starrett so I can get precise measurements. Okay. <laughs> Jesus, Bill. Starrett.